Welcome back, everybody. I'm Peter Frumhoff. I'm the Director of Science and Policy at the Union of Concerned Scientists, and I'm delighted to be able to chair uh, this session. I want to thank uh, our friends and colleagues at the Stockholm Environment Institute and other co-sponsors of this terrific conference for the opportunity to join you uh, today and tomorrow. Um, we're going to focus this session on, as the title suggests, the climate responsibilities, risks, and performance of fossil fuel producers, focusing on companies at the base of the carbon supply chain whose products, as we've heard earlier, are, have contributed so much to the climate challenge that we're now wrestling with. The, um, you know, the, the, the conference is in an important uh, degree focused on climate policies. In addition to formal policies at a national or international level, there's also the question of how non-state actors behave, uh, uh, both uh, producers in this case, uh, the focus of so much questions about investment and divestment and other uh, responses to civil society uh, engagement around their behavior in a carbon constrained world, their responsibilities, um, both in terms of their business models, how do they align their business models with the carbon constrained world, and, and, and as well as how they might align their, their political behavior, their communication strategies. Um, and their activity to shape policy in light of the carbon constraints that we all now recognize we face. The three panelists will each speak for 10 minutes, uh, bringing different perspectives to bear on the question of what we might imagine a responsible fossil fuel company uh, should look like in light of the moment that we're in. And think about how that information can become actionable in the context of decisions by a range of uh, 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 political leaders as well as by other non-state actors. So we're going to lead off with um, Miles Allen, Professor Allen, at the University of Oxford. Um, and Miles, you have the floor. Thank you. And thank you uh, for inviting me to talk to this because I'm, I'm a climate scientist and I've only been recently dabbling in this whole um, investment uh, uh, question, prompted largely by the students, originally by the students in the University of Oxford, of course came to me um, when they were um, campaigning for the university to divest from fossil fuels, to talk to them about the whole principles of, 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 of why, we divest, why we should be divesting and, and what a divestment strategy should look like. Um, so what came out of this was an initiative uh, funded, very, very small initiative involving these three people, Cameron Hepburn, a well-known economist here in Oxford, and Richard Miller, who's doing all the work on this. Um, and uh, I would be here, uh, but he's uh, uh, currently on a well-earned holiday in Australia. So, um, well, no doubt he's learning about the coal production that we heard about this morning. Anyway, um, so I, I just wanted to start um, because we, we had here in Oxford last week um, a meeting on the 1.5 degree goal, a sort of much more science-oriented meeting. And I just wanted to re remind you of where we're at, because there's quite a lot of, um, uh, still seems to be quite a lot of confusion on that. So uh, we're now at about one degree. Um, we were briefly well above one degree, but that was a lot of variability in, as part of that earlier this year. Um, but human-induced warming is currently around one degree and has increased by about half a degree since the 1980s. So that's the context um, of uh, the way we need to evaluate what companies are doing to be consistent with um, climate, sta climate stabilization at various different levels of warming. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to this as we get to the end of the talk. Um, of it, we've, we've all heard we need to get to net zero carbon dioxide emissions in order to stabilize climate. Um, and here's one of those classic scenario spaghetti diagrams of how different scenarios get to zero at different rates, um, corresponding to different levels of warming in the future. But it's salutary to note where we are now so this is the uh, IPCC um, Working Group 3 family of scenarios that meets the 2.5 degree, 2 degree, and 1.5 degree goals. The cross shows where current emissions are, which immediately illustrates a problem with evaluating companies against these scenarios. Because any company could say, well, why evaluate me against these scenarios? Because the scenarios are obviously wrong. Okay? And, and so, so that, that's, that's something which we do need to, to think, of, think about. Um, this is a... Um, uh, a slide I injected this morning following the, 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 the talks this morning, and I, I do appreciate the organizers being very flexible in allowing me to update my PowerPoint almost continuously during the morning. Um, <laughs> another, way of, another way of plotting these scenarios, these are the same scenarios, but plotted now against the fraction of extracted carbon that is sequestered as a function of time. 
Okay, so it's exactly the same information. These are cost optimal scenarios that achieve likely less than two degrees of warming. And you see, in all cases, that fraction reaches 100%. Of course, it has to. Net zero emissions means 100% sequestration. It's another way of saying the same thing. Okay, the 100% doesn't tell you how much carbon we're using at that point, but you do know in order for it to be net zero, um, it need, you, need to be, um, you need to be sequestering a ton of CO2 for every ton that's released. And the really important point about this figure is the color shading, which is the total cost of mitigation in these different scenarios. And notice the very striking separation of the most expensive scenarios, the ones which, frankly, we're not going to achieve because the public won't tolerate spending the size of the current world economy on climate mitigation in 2080. That's what those dark red colors mean. Dark red means today's GDP. That's what that color scale leads up to. Um, if, if, if those scenarios have a spending that much in 20, of course, the, the, the world economy will be bigger in those scenarios, but not that much bigger that they won't even notice today's GDP. Um, and, uh, and those are the scenarios in which the sequestered fraction goes up slowest. So it's absolutely imperative we're going to meet any of these climate goals that we get this sequestered fraction up. And we need to place the burden of responsibility in, in, in getting that sequestered fraction up onto the main beneficiaries of sequestration, which are the owners of fossil fuel assets. Because, of course, if you have sequestration available, the owners of fossil fuel assets can continue to use their assets in a climate-constrained world. This is the, the problem with the sort of science-based targets we heard about, um, uh, which, which are uh, starting to address this. We, we heard about this, this in the, in the uh, parallel session before lunch. Um, they're starting to address this problem. They're running out till 2050, they are one scenario of what has to happen for the future. And there's a whole lot of different, um, uh, uh, th these are all sort of power generation, w what happens to emissions in power generation in cement and so on. And within this scenario, there's a, a set of assumptions about how sequestration, for example, penetrates into the power sector and so forth, just as there was in Paul Eakin's modeling earlier, uh, earlier today. And the problem with that, of course, is that those assumptions are contestable. They could be contested by a company where you ask the company, does your, does your business plan, is it compliance with the IEA 450 scenario? In my view, a perfectly legitimate uh, response from the company would be, we don't believe the IEA 450 scenario. We just don't, we don't think that their assumptions about the price of whatever um, is, are, are, are valid. And so why should, why should you um, complain that our company's plans are not consistent with it? Um, the other issue, of course, is the scenario builders are unaccountable. Um, you have the, you know, the IEA is, is accountable to no one, if you like. Um, and, uh, uh, and also, as I pointed out at the beginning, the scenario is also typically badly out of date by the time they even get published, never mind the time they get used. This is something which I would argue is more useful for evaluating what a company is doing than a scenario. Um, it, because it's an identity, it's something which is completely obvious. It's the average rate of reduction of emissions between now and the time they reach zero per degree of warming, if the average is taken per degree of warming in the future, has to equal today's emissions divided by the outstanding warming between now and the time emissions reach zero. This is an identity in the sense that the, the average of a gradient has to equal the change. That's just, you know, if I, if I follow a path from here to there, the average gradient as I move from here to there, has to equal the change from here to there. I can talk about it afterwards if anybody wants to dispute this, but it's just true, <laughs> okay? Crucially, this identity applies whether emissions are expressed in terms of tons of CO2, as a percentage of baseline, as a in emissions intensity, as a per capita, whatever. You just can't change the units as you go along. That's important, okay? So once you've said, as a company, we would like to be measured in this way, against this baseline or against uh, as, a, as an emissions intensity metric or whatever, um, provided you then track down towards zero, you are making measurable progress towards, climate, uh, to, towards being compliant, compliant with a stable climate. Interestingly, if you plot that spaghetti diagram, shown again on the left, against future warming, so the axis here if I've got a pointer, never mind, I've got a pointer. Um, the axis here is temperature. Sorry if you can't read it. That's one degree, that's one and a half degrees, that's two degrees. Um, and these are those same scenarios, but plotted as 100% of baseline, 50%, 4%. Okay? 
Notice that we sort of uncooked the spaghetti. Okay? You've gone from this mess to nice straight lines going down to the temperature you end up at. So if you plot emissions this way, if you're a company and you've got a strategy for getting to net zero, it's really easy to see how you're doing. You just follow the line. So, implications. To reach, net to reach zero by two degrees, emissions have to fall on average by 10% for every tenth of a degree of warming from now on. Fortunately, we're at one degree, which makes the maths easy. It's all going to get a lot more difficult in a few years' time. So it's really important to get people's minds around this now. Okay? Um, one and a half degrees, 20%. Okay? That's slightly more complicated maths, but not that much more complicated. Okay. Right now, a tenth of a degree of warming takes um, six to eight years. So that's pretty quick. Um, but, of course, this rate would slow as emissions fall. So that's why you see in this diagram these lines are straight, even though these lines are curving, because, of course, the warming is slowing down as we approach zero. <coughs> Based on this, we have crafted in this Oxford Martin initiative some questions that we think investors, responsible investors, should be asking the companies they own. Um, the first question we'd like companies to be asked is, at what global temperature will your activities and the, product, and the products you sell, or scope one, scope two, scope three emissions if you want the jargon, be consistent with net zero carbon dioxide emissions? Companies should be asked to declare on this. Second, they should be asked, what's your strategy for achieving net zero? Um, and crucially, who do you think is going to pay for it? And finally, how do you propose to monitor progress to zero as the world warms? Let me just sort of end by, I, 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 yeah, I can, I can end, um, by just illustrating how a company might respond to these questions. So to the net zero question, it might reply one and a half degrees or two degrees or huh? Um, if it replies huh, then, you know, investors have a legitimate ask of that company's board, given that this is a big issue for the product they're selling, should they perhaps engage a little bit with understanding it so that they can actually answer that question. Um, arguably, one fossil major has given an answer to this question uh, in that Shell's um, mountains and oceans scenarios sort of position them in the area, although they haven't really divulged much about their strategy, in particular the strategy for how the transition is to be paid for. So if you're a fossil fuel major, your strategy might be runoff. We're just going to run down our mines and shut down our company before temperatures reach uh, one and a half or two degrees. That might be your strategy, but of course then you have to say, how's that going to be guaranteed and can we really believe you on that? Uh, the, of course, if they have got a runoff-based strategy, then of course there is this, they, they shouldn't be exploring for new resources and so on. So that, that, that has clear implications as well. Alternatively, they could say, we're going to make a smooth transition to 100% sequestration. That's pretty much Shell's strategy um, in their sort of oceans, mountains and oceans scenarios. But then the next question has to be, well, who's going to pay for it? And at the moment, uh, in their sort of the, the scenario is that it gets paid for by future taxpayers. Um, arguably, uh, in, in an ethical world, it should be paid for by the industry, by its shareholders, or by its current customers, because these are the ones who are benefiting from continuing to put carbon in the atmosphere. Um, and when we come to monitoring progress, we argue that progress should be monitored best by indexing progress to, against actually how much warming we're seeing in the world. Um, and if you want to, uh, an index we released to mark the conference last week, globalwarmingindex.org um, gives you an up to the second uh, estimate of uh, the current rate of uh, human induced warming. We're good. Thank you, Miles. All right, thank you. Next up is my uh, colleague from the Union of Concerned Scientists, Kathy Mulvey, the uh, head of our climate accountability campaign. Kathy. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Peter. And thanks, Miles, for that intro. So the Union of Concerned Scientists is a US-based, science-based advocacy organization. And what I'd like to do is start by providing some brief context on the campaign that I lead um, on fossil fuel producer accountability and then spend the bulk of my time giving a sneak preview of a climate accountability scorecard that we're going to be releasing in just 10 days. So um, 
The work that, that UCS has been doing on fossil fuel producer accountability is grounded in the carbon majors research and analysis by Rick Heedy, which we heard about in one of the parallel sessions, uh, which found that, that two-thirds of emissions since the start of the Industrial Revolution can be traced to just 90 entities. And here, for example, we see the contributions of the top 20 investor and state-owned companies. This is in terms of the emissions that are traced to the, uh, the fossil fuels that they extracted and entered into commerce. So our campaign also takes as a jumping off point arguments put forth by my colleague Peter Frumhoff along with Naomi Oreskes and Rick Heedy um, about the climate responsibilities of major fossil fuel producers and it builds on a workshop that UCS co-convened with the Climate Accountability Institute in 2012 about lessons that can be learned from tobacco control. Um, so over the past several months um, oops, uh, UCS consulted with a range of experts and drew on a range of initiatives and standards that are that are out there already uh, to develop a set of 30 metrics to measure companies' progress in uh, four of the five areas that, that we see here. So we, we looked at CDP, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, the Oxford Martin Working Principles, and we consulted with many of you and, and other experts around the methodology itself as well as the, um, the findings. And, um, what we did was actually then score each metric um, for the companies that we looked at on a scale that ranged from advanced as best practice to egregious, which is demonstrating severe irresponsibility. Um, and I will say that we did not assess company performance on paying its share of the costs of climate-related damages and adaptation, as no fossil fuel producer is yet doing so or has begun to do so. Um, so our scorecard measures the climate-related positions and actions of eight companies during the period from the beginning of 2015 through May of this year. And the, the companies in our sample are the five leading investor-owned oil and gas companies ranked in terms of their cumulative emissions, and then the three leading uh, investor-owned U.S. coal companies in terms of cumulative emissions. And these eight companies are responsible for 15% of emissions since 1850. So we focused on this subset of the carbon majors that have the greatest responsibility where UCS has leverage because they are investor owned and also because they have significant recognition and or operations in the US. And now, in advance of the release of our report, I want to share with you a few of our most compelling findings. And some of them actually relate to uh, one, of the, one of the ingredients that hasn't really been touched on yet today, which is the disinformation and deception by the fossil fuel companies. So we've heard about the policies on the supply and demand side um, that we would like to see enacted. And, and one of the major obstacles to that is how uh, these companies have actually uh, spread climate disinformation and uh, sought to use that to, to block policies. And several of them actually now insist that they don't deny climate science. So we wanted to unpack that. Um, and we analyzed each company's direct and indirect uh, roles in spreading climate disinformation and found that seven of these eight companies have failed to renounce disinformation on climate science and policy. So there were two parts of this analysis, uh, direct statements and indirect statements. And we found a much greater range in the accuracy and consistency of these eight companies' direct public statements on climate science. The scores actually ranged the whole spectrum of our scale, uh, with Shell earning a grade of advanced, and ExxonMobil bringing up the rear at egregious based on statements like the one made just a few months ago at the company's annual meeting by CEO Rex Tillerson, where he um, actually disparaged climate models and claimed that the IPC itself admits that there's no scientific basis for setting a two-degree target. 
Um, the second part of our analysis considered these companies' indirect involvement in climate disinformation via their affiliation <laughs> with trade associations and industry groups. And here are the seven U.S. groups that we included in the study based on their documented roles in spreading climate science disinformation and their use of disinformation in opposing recent policy proposals in the U.S. So one example you'll see here is ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, which peddles disinformation about climate science while attempting to roll back state-level policies in the U.S. that would encourage, um, that would reduce carbon pollution and accelerate the transition to clean energy. BP and Shell have already left ALEC, with Shell actually citing the, the difference between its own positions on climate science and ALEC as the reason for its departure. Uh, and tens of thousands of UCS members, along with others, have called on ExxonMobil and Chevron to follow suit, most recently around the company's annual meetings this spring. Um, but here are the results, literally from bad to worse. Uh, all eight companies maintain ties with trade associations and industry groups that spread climate disinformation. We also looked at how these companies are planning for a world free from carbon pollution and found that only BP and Shell have publicly expressed support for the international climate agreement reached in Paris and its global temperature goals. Still, none of these eight companies that we studies, studied has laid out a company-wide pathway or plan to align its business model with the new reality established in Paris. We evaluated these companies' disclosure and governance of their political activity in general, as well as their support for specific U.S. policies that would address climate change. And here, lack of transparency is really a significant obstacle to any analysis of corporate political activity and influence. Um, limited and patchy disclosure requirements really restrict the amount of information that's available, and particularly when it comes to uh, payments to third-party groups like trade associations. So in terms of these companies' positions on U.S. policy action to reduce carbon emissions, we found that um, BP, ExxonMobil, and Shell publicly support at least one generic type of policy to reduce carbon emissions, but none of the three have actually connected that stated support to meaningful action. We also examined companies' disclosure to investors of the climate risks that they face. And we assessed company disclosure of regulatory risks, of physical risks, of market risks, and of their, and their corporate governance um, by the board and senior management of climate-related risks. We concluded in this area that all eight companies can and should do more to, to fulfill existing climate risk disclosure requirements. And they also need to begin to prepare for enhanced dis disclosure regimes in the future. And Confirming this analysis, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission has actually launched an investigation of whether ExxonMobil has adequately disclosed and accounted for climate risks. So lest anyone be jumping, jumping to the mistaken conclusion that uh, BP and Shell were leaders across the board based on what you've heard so far, both of those companies actually scored poor in terms of their disclosure of the physical risks that are caused or exacerbated by climate change. And yeah, previous research by my colleague Gretchen Goldman and others has documented that many companies that operate refineries are not disclosing climate-related physical risks to shareholders or to local communities. So the inaugural edition of the scorecard provides a baseline assessment of how major fossil fuel producers are meeting a set of standards for responsible action on climate change in the four broad areas that I outlined at the beginning renouncing disinformation, uh, planning for a world that's free from carbon pollution, supporting fair and effective climate policies, and fully disclosing their climate risks. And in sum, no company scored better than its peers in all areas, and several were relative leaders in some areas and relative laggards in others. And each, score, each company's scores actually range sometimes quite significantly across the four areas. But our goal in researching and releasing the scorecard isn't to confirm with data what we suspected. Uh, our team really hopes that this inaugural scorecard will spark the public, investors, and policymakers to pay more attention to the company's climate-related positions and actions. 
in turn creating a greater demand for transparency from the companies and uh, these developments would actually help to improve future iterations of the scorecard and ultimately provide incentives for company action that can be consistent with keeping global temperature increase well below two degrees. So we really do see this as an iterative project and um, really expect that, it, it, that while we've assessed eight companies in this edition, um, we and others can use the methodology which will be transparent and publicly available to assess other companies in the future. So our release and outreach plan begins on October 6th, that's just in about 10 days, and it'll culminate at next spring's annual meetings of these fossil fuel companies. And I really look forward to a robust discussion about the findings that I've previewed here, as well as um, your suggestions throughout the conference about how we can help, how we can reach shareholders, investors, policymakers, public prosecutors, scientists, legal experts, and uh, activists with the information that, uh, that we've shared here. So, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Great, thanks so much. So the final speaker before we open this up for a discussion is Aniko Horvath from the Business and Human Rights uh, Center to speak to us about the equity dimensions, considerations regarding fossil fuel company responsibility. Thank you, Aniko. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you for inviting us. Um, as Peter mentioned, I will be bringing a slightly different perspective, uh, more of a human rights perspective into this discussion. My key message is that fossil fuel companies have a responsibility to act on climate change as a human rights issue, and there's a growing momentum among civil society, investors, and companies that ensures that to ensure that this happens by highlighting the financial, reputational, and legal risks for companies if they don't do so. So to set the scene uh, from a human rights perspective, who better to quote than Mary Robinson, former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, who said, Climate change is the biggest human rights challenge of our time. But how does it really impact people? One of the most illustrative examples recently was Typhoon Haiyan, which hit the Philippines on the 8th of November, 2013. This one typhoon claimed more than 6,000 lives, more than 27,000 uh, people were injured, and more than 6 million displaced. Now, research has shown that 80% of extreme weather events are linked to climate change. And although um, we can't yet, as we discussed with Peter earlier, um, link specific events to climate change, um, this is a pretty good indicator um, uh, of the likelihood of linkage. Um, these events are not limited to the Philippines and can take many other forms, including droughts, um, destroying homes and livelihoods and access to water, um, and, and floods as well. So what do individual fossil fuel companies have to do with these impacts? We heard um, earlier today, and uh, Kathy referenced as well, um, Rick Heedy's work. Um, he made a breakthrough study in making the link between companies and climate change clear. Uh, he identified 90 carbon major entities that were responsible for more than 63% of global industry emissions of carbon dioxide and methane between 1854 and 2010. 50 of these entities are investor-owned fossil fuel companies, including Chevron, ExxonMobil, BP, and Shell. This is significant for civil society working on climate change as it allowed, to, as it allowed them to make the direct link between individual companies um, and carbon emissions. So let's keep this study in mind and the example of uh, Typhoon Haiyan in mind as we go on. Um, and take a step back first to uh, seeing as climate change is a human rights issue, let's look at the international framework that's available to us um, to establish what corporate responsibility um, exists uh, for human rights. The UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights was endorsed unanimously by the UN Human Rights Council in June 2011. It has three key pillars. First, the state's duty to protect human rights. Second, the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, and the third, to provide access to remedy. So companies have an internationally recognized responsibility to avoid causing or contributing to adverse human rights impacts under the guiding principles. There have been various efforts to make the linkage between the guiding principles and climate change clearer, 
including uh, the International Bar Association's report on climate justice and human rights. Um, it made specific recommendations on corporate responsibility, including the promotion of the guiding principles, and the encouragement of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to develop model human rights policies that integrate climate change as well, and the encouragement of legal requirements for companies to report on greenhouse gas emissions and to establish clear standards for reporting. Now, although companies have started to recognize their human rights responsibilities, this hasn't been the case um, for uh, making the link between climate change and human rights. So at Business and Human Rights Resource Center, we reach out to companies on a daily basis to invite them to respond to human rights al allegations about their practices. Our average response rate is 80%. Yet, when we reach out to companies regarding climate change impacts and when we try to make the link between climate change and human rights, the response rate is much lower. For example, last year we invited them to, uh, we invited the top 20 companies uh, ranked by Oxford University in a report as having the highest energy generation from subcritical coal to respond. Only four out of the 20 companies responded and none of them actually made the link between um, the, their human rights impacts and um, climate change impacts clear. So there's a long way to go. Um, now, how is civil society pushing companies to act? Uh, I'm going to talk about three different levers. Um, first, harnessing the reputational risks and benefits for companies. Next, the financial risks and benefits. And finally, the legal, well, there's only risks in terms of legal. Um, so, so in terms of uh, focusing on reputational risks and benefits, um, this is mainly relevant for companies with a public image, with a brand to protect. Um, and uh, strategies that civil society has used to engage companies can range from more confrontational public campaigns and advocacy through benchmarks and rankings, similar to U what UCS is doing now, through the critical friends approach, so combining benchmarks and rankings with the more um, campaign <coughs> tools when relevant, and uh, all the way to joint actions by companies that are more voluntary and more engaging. Um, in terms of financial risks and benefits, this is uh, interesting because this is what um, many companies that don't necessarily have a public facing image will pay attention to. What are, are their investors saying? What are their shareholders saying? Um, it, it, this actually matters to them. So there has been an increasing recognition, um, more and more investor coalitions coming together. Um, and not only, what's interesting is that it's not only socially responsible investors um, that are coming out and um, speaking on climate change, but also uh, more, more traditional investors and asset managers. For example, just this month, uh, BlackRock issued a report, and BlackRock is the biggest asset manager um, in the world. It issued a report um, that's main conclusion was that all investors should incorporate climate change awareness into their investment processes. So there is movement um, in this, and, and there is, um, there's a lot, uh, of course, a lot more work to be done as well. Um, shareholder acti activism has also picked up recently. We've heard about some shareholder resolutions with BP and Shell um, and, and others, many, many others on the way. And in terms of litigation, um, this has become a hot topic, and here I will return to the Philippines case and, and Rick Heedy's work. Um, one, of the, one of the major cases now um, that we will hear more about later today is, um, is a petition with the Philippines Human Rights Commission that Greenpeace and other NGOs and typhoon survivors have brought. Um, it's based on the link between the link between individual companies' uh, carbon emissions and uh, the human rights impacts caused by climate change um, in the Philippines, including by Typhoon Haiyan. Um, the complaint is currently with the Human Rights Commission, um, and actually the deadline for companies to respond to the complaint is this week, so hopefully we'll hear more about it as we go forward. But there are other um, cases uh, that are either on the way or have, have been decided. And there are various legal grounds for raising climate litigation cases, including health and environmental laws, duty of care, 
um, long-term financial risks, and currently human rights law is being explored um, as a basis, but at the, at the moment it's mostly used as an ethical narrative to back up cases. And finally, just a challenge to leave you with, and this is something that we will hear about more about later today. Um, from, if we're talking about a human rights perspective, uh, we also have to, to acknowledge that um, reducing carbon emissions, uh, the way that we reduce carbon emissions also has human rights implications. And um, this is true both in terms of uh, the transition away from fossil fuels, so the way coal mines are closed, um, and ensuring that workers are adequately trained, they have social benefits in place, um, et cetera, but also in terms of the movement towards renewable energy, making sure that renewable energy projects, wind, solar projects, take into account land rights, the right to life security, um, human rights defenders um, rights as well so um, this is just a challenge that i would like to leave with you leave with you with and uh, i look forward to the discussion thank all you. right thank you so much all right so maybe our panelists can move to the table make yourselves a little more visible to the audience and let me actually start with you all and ask if you have any um, responses, queries, comments on one another's uh, talks just before we open it up to a broader discussion. Uh, for Eniko, actually, I'd like to, uh, so I know extractives is one of the sectors that the corporate human rights benchmark is looking at um, in this pilot. And I wondered uh, how you think that the rankings that come out of that process may intersect with uh, what people are, are calling for in, in terms of the um, advance, uh, the, the measures that we're talking about with regard to fossil fuel supply. Thank you. Um, so for those of you that don't know about the cor corporate human rights benchmark, it's um, a collaboration among investors and NGOs to rank the top 100 companies, including the extractive sector, um, on human rights policies and practices um, coming out in early 2017. Um, and uh, in, terms of, in terms of how, how uh, the issues that we're discussing here will be reflected in it, um, I would say implicitly they will be, um, but explicitly currently the, the benchmark is not looking at climate change per se um, in its methodology. It's, uh, it's actually a pilot methodology and in the next iterations I think it would be great to, to try to link um, the UCS's work and, and try to figure out how to make these clear um, indicators um, play in the benchmark as well. Just, just a, a comment, really. Um, you, you mentioned that we, um, we, in fact, we were talking over lunch about making the link between individual weather events and climate change. I, I, I just wanted to clarify on that one. What, sorry, I was, if I was misleading over lunch, but uh, we, we, we can make a link. Um, it has to be probabilistic because, of course, we don't tend to see events that could not have happened without human influence on climate, and not all the extreme weather events have necessarily been made more probable by climate change. But that, that science is advancing pretty rapidly, and, and I think that's that's actually been quite helpful to this process. I hope it is anyway. Absolutely. I, I think the point was that we haven't done that in the case of Typhoon uh, uh, Haiyan that was in the Well, I think attempts have been made and the results are ambiguous. That's right. Um, exactly. So, so that, it's, it's not that there isn't a sensible question to be asked. It's Absolutely. just that the answer is not entirely clear. So, all right, let's open it up to the audience. I'll get some maybe three questions to start us off and then see where we go. Yes, ma'am. You and you and one in the back. Thank you. I have a question for Katie and for Eniko. Um, there are three sources, at least, of in, uh, in, signals to companies. The market, prices, uh, um, civil society organizations, and government policies. To which the, the companies listen to the most? And for Eniko, um, I, I, I think that uh, it is important what you said about destructive, uh, uh, destructive uh, companies, but I think from the point of view of consumption of energy, we have to address as well the responsibilities of military industry. Uh, 
because the construction of military, the weaponry and so on, the transport of that and the use of it do, do produce emissions and civil rights violations. Thank you. Yeah, take, take, if you can introduce yourself as well. Um, I'm Hugh Lee, working in the coal industry. Uh, you've been talking about investor-owned companies. What about the national, the state-owned companies like in Saudi Arabia or Gazprom in Russia? When concerned investors in this country engage in dialogue with BP and Shell, they say, BP and Shell reply, well, it doesn't really matter what we do. If the state-owned companies aren't going to do anything, it'll, it's a waste of our time doing anything. And one more up in the back. Hi, uh, Charlie. God, I'm very loud. Charlie Cronick from Greenpeace. Um, so I'm, I work for a campaigning organization. So the, the question I would always ask when talking about any of these kinds of engagements would be what would actually be the objective of rating fossil fuel companies? And so I, there's a range of responses that these companies could make. They could be held accountable in terms of compensation. They could be, um, you know, they just in purely financial terms as well as legal and sort of, I'm not, I have a hard time visualizing what a retrospective uh, remedy would be going back to emissions to 1850 uh, beyond, a, beyond a financial one. But finally, what do we really want? Are, are, is the expectation that these companies will transform themselves into a sustainable energy industry? And I guess that's implied in Miles's suggestion that it's about not net zero as opposed to just zero emissions. Or realistically, are we actually suggesting that what we need is a mechanism that allows for the, the unwinding and ultimately the decline, uh, you know, managed decline of these companies? All right. Plenty of fodder. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in and, and uh, first to the, the question about the, the forces um, at play. Uh, I, it, it's, they're certainly all essential at this point, and uh, I would say that uh, civil society is one that actually, they, they, are, they all actually interplay with each other. So investors will cite to civil society actions or, or pressure, um, and it, it can help to change the, the business conditions around companies. Um, civil society is, is often pressuring governments to act, and um, and clearly, you know, governments set the, the framework for investment. So, I, so I see it as as um, inter interrelated um, in terms of the. Um, state-owned enterprises, um, they're, they're, it, you know, we've chosen to focus on the investor-owned companies because of the responsibility that they bear and the, and the leverage. And I think in particular, um, looking at the, the campaign of deception and disinformation uh, that's, been, that's been carried out in a concerted way by, by several of the major fossil fuel producers, um, that's that's something that it's been the investor-owned companies have actually driven, and so there's a there's a particular role to play in in getting getting those companies out of the way of policy advances. Uh, and as far as the objective of of ranking the companies, uh, you know, we are looking to put concrete. And, and specific actions and recommendations in front of these companies to which they can be held accountable by their investors, by policymakers, uh, by by the public. And um, you know, you you may look at the steps that these companies have to take and make some judgments about what the trajectory for their business um, ought to be. Um, at, the, at this point, uh, you know, we are really actually looking for, for specific actions that these companies can and should take now that would, uh, that would l limit the, the damage and, and start to turn things in the right direction in terms of the, the impact that they're having on, on the climate. Thanks. Um, I agree with Kathy that in terms of the signals, it's it's a combination uh, of everything. Um, but also, um, it depends on what company we're talking about. So, um, and this goes to the state-owned company question. Um, of course, uh, with Shell and BP, uh, a ranking uh, it might have more traction. 
than with a state-owned company. We've done a previous outreach regarding human rights um, when we found that state-owned companies were the least responsive um, to public pressure and, and also to, to generally um, questionnaires. So there's definitely more diplomatic pressure and uh, needed and, and more commitments needed by the governments to move those um, forward. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that we can't start with the investor-owned companies. Um, yeah, and in terms of uh, addressing the impacts of the military industry, um, completely agree as well. Um, that that we, we need to look at um, we need to look at everything <laughs> together. Um, if I could take the the question from Greenpeace and the question from the gentleman in the coal industry together, just because I, I, I like that challenge. Um, I, I think that's you're absolutely right that the we need to be clear what we're actually trying to get fossil fuel companies to do. Um, I think we need to recognise, and indeed campaigning organisations like Greenpeace need to recognise that we will still be using fossil fuels at the end of this century, uh, for perhaps for the production of cement, probably not for the generation of energy, but, um, or, and very possibly for flying around the plane, in, unless we come up with a, flying around in planes, unless we come up with an alternative to jet fuel or whatever. Um, there will still be economically attractive uh, applications of fossil fuels for the indefinite future. And therefore the determinant of whether we manage to stabilize the climate at some point this century is going to be whether we manage to achieve net zero. CO2 emissions into the atmosphere, not whether we um, succeed in banning the fossil uh, industry entirely. Um, if the only option is a ban, then it's not going to happen. So, uh, so I, I think we need to we need to move on from that kind of uh, sort of the, the, the objective cannot be to make the fossil fuel industry crawl away and die um, because it won't, um, and uh, and and arguably it shouldn't on a sort of human rights argument as well. I mean, arguably, we don't have any right to tell the people working in that industry that they should just crawl away and die. But they do need to be able to demonstrate that they have a viable future in a net zero world. And that's exactly what we argue for. Unfortunately, mandatory sequestration now is a pretty horrible um, slogan. So I, I'm not expecting to hear you guys shouting it anytime soon. But one, one day you will um, be shouting that slogan, or perhaps a snappier version of it. And on that day is when we start to win in the climate issue. Okay. Uh, here, there's a gentleman back here and over here. So, on my, yeah, my name is Laura Merrill from the Global Subsidies Initiative of ISD. And it's about um, scenario takers and scenario makers, really, because... Um, Obviously, those scenarios are out there from the IPCC to give us ideas about what the future might hold. And it seemed to me, perhaps, what you're suggesting is encouraging companies to get on a pathway and start to set some of these goals. So I, I like that idea of shifting to scenario makers rather than scenario takers. We've also tried to do this on subsidies when we've tried to um, model what happens when you remove the subsidies, but then when you start reinvesting them back into renewables and, and energy efficiency. And um, So my question is, why are you just talking about sequestration? Why aren't you looking at reinvestment within these companies of these um, huge amounts back into renewables and different business models? Let's take the other two questions before answering that. I'm Kier Kühne from Lingo. Um, I would like to um, mention an initiative that um, I perceive as um, that didn't get much attention globally so far that could um, combine the different approaches of the climate scorecard and the benchmarking and so on. And um, that is the proposal of an economy um, of the common good that comes from Austria. And it's basically um, adding a um, common good accounting to the financial accounting or financial reporting that companies have to do every year. And um, there's a whole matrix where um, companies evalu are evaluated against what they have done for the climate, for the environment, for poor people, and lots of different things that have to do with the common good. And um, by making that mandatory and incentivizing uh, 
uh, working for the common good, the game is changed in a way that um, making money is not the ultimate bottom line any longer, but it's um, only one um, element and the common good is the wider bottom line that will drive the economic mainstream in that direction. And I would like to invite you to uh, have a look at that and see how this could combine with your work. And it was over, let's see, where was, it was over here, yes, Tom, yeah. Uh, Tom, I found to see you from the Climate Equity Reference Project. And I just want to, uh, to me, there's uh, something that needs to be stated that hasn't been stated, which is that we're in a planet in which there's very large corporates coexisting with company, with countries. I, I was going to say companies. Um, and there, we, there's a prior question as to which entities are responsible for what that hasn't really been articulated. And, you know, we're going to have all kinds of costs. We're not just going to have the costs associated with reaching net zero in the, in the core economy. We're also going to have adaptation costs. We're also going to have loss and damage costs. We're going to have all kinds of very serious just transition costs of all kinds. And um, I do think we need to speculate at least a little bit at this conference about which kinds of costs are associated with which kinds of actions by which kinds of actors. Um, you know, there, for just one other thing, to give an example uh, of what I'm talking about, there is a project called the Climate Justice Project, which has been pounding away for some years now about the fact that the carbon majors, precisely because they have this history that goes back to 1850, should have some sort of particular responsibility for loss and damage costs. And I don't know if there's a theoretical or polit a political argument for that that, that holds water, but it, it, we should at least be discussing this kind of thing. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Sure. Um, I mean, I can address that last point. Um, I entirely agree that there needs to be more clarity around um, roles and responsibilities and who's, um, who's going to be um, responsible for what. And there are a number of different frameworks that haven't been aligned um, that need to be aligned. So the guiding principles on business and human rights, um, but also, you know, the Paris Agreement. I, there, there's no, um, there's no clear uh, connection or even discussion between the different groups. Um, so we need more alignment, even amongst ourselves, um, people working in this field. Um, and and I agree that there needs, that there's a lot more that needs to be done around that. Um, on the uh, scenario makers versus scenario takers, I mean that, that's exactly what we would like to to, to have. There's, there's a lot of imagination within companies that, that I think needs to be brought effectively to bear on this problem. And if we, if, if we should avoid falling in the trap of telling companies um, precisely what, what, what they should be doing, so that's exactly what, what we're, we're aiming to get here. Um, the reason I'm talking about sequestration is because this is a meeting about fossil fuel companies. As, as, I mean, so if you own a large amount of buried fossil energy, then the only way that it can be used in a climate-constrained world is if we crack the problem of disposing of the CO2. Um, I, I think it's... And, and, and this comes back to the sort of economy of the common good idea. Um, my personal view, and I, I, I'm not an economist and still less a sort of political scientist, but my impression is um, that we, we solve problems, environmental problems, most effectively when we manage to isolate them and say this company is responsible for this thing and they need to fix it. And when, when problems are diffused across the whole economy, um, solving them becomes much more complicated. And so, um, one, you know, rather than um, reinventing economics, we could just say, well, actually, we're not reinventing anything here. We're essentially talking about a packaging directive. You want the energy contained in that fossil fuels. You don't want the packaging, which is the CO2 that it generates. So give the CO2 back to the company that's selling you the product. Problem solved. Okay? Arguably, this, this actually, the, the, the law already exists to enforce this. And if we could simplify the problem simply to make providers of fossil energy responsible for disposing of the waste generated by the products they sell, then we won't have a problem. 
uh, on the question of the of very large corporations coexisting with countries, and in fact, some very large corporations having uh, annual revenues that are larger than the GDPs of many of the countries where they operate, it's uh, it's precisely this reason that uh, we need that you know the guiding principles recognize the both the state duty to protect and the corporate responsibility to respect. And uh, we, you know, we as a, a society need to step back and think about the, the, not just the license formally that we grant to these companies to operate in our name and, and do business, but the social license to operate and, um, and, and what it, if, these, if companies have breached the public trust, as in the case of the fossil, many of the major fossil fuel companies by deceiving us, um, there, you know, we need to be looking at, at, at the levers that we have to hold them directly accountable, as well as to, um, to really uh, ero you know, they erode that social license and enable us to put in place the policies through government institutions that, that we need to see happen. Okay, three more questions. Um, gentleman back here and uh, the woman. Uh, I have a comment in the context, but I think is the strange willingness to accommodate the notion that fossil fuel companies should continue to exist in their current form. And, uh, I'm Bob Massey I'm from the University of Massachusetts, but I've spoken all over the world. I never used the phrase in their current form. Uh, well, let me get uh, let me explain. I speak to a lot of major pension funds and finance about the long-term question. We've seen dramatic change, and what we're seeing is the growing conviction that the fossil fuel extraction company, with all, the, is a fundamentally broken model led by people who don't know what they're doing. Now, let me give you some examples. Shell lost nine billion trying to get into the Arctic. Many companies are now borrowing to pay their dividends. They're putting $600 billion a year into exploring for things, for resources that we don't need. Some of the companies now are under tremendous legal pressure. We have in the United States 17 attorneys general that are attacking Exxon for having committed fraud for decades. That could affect their cash flow over time if that uh, suit succeeds. We have the Securities Exchange Commission just this week announcing that they believe, uh, or they're investigating whether uh, Exxon fraudulently represented its resources when the price of oil dropped, and on and on and on. I mean, there are so many examples now. Also, of the companies that you examined, the two coal companies, Peabody and Arch, went bankrupt. So we've already seen the unthinkable happen. Peabody go from $1,000 a share to two, and then go bankrupt. Arch is disappearing. Why should we be positing that this is going to continue as we expect when we see investors increasingly revolting against what is an abuse of their money. All right, hold that response. We have two more questions. Thank you. I'm Henri Weissman from the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project at Idri in Paris. Just like to follow up on the um, sequestration discussion. Because, I mean, the, the concern is, I mean, what you said is completely true, but the concern is to consider that um, as the silver bullet that will solve the problem. I know that you didn't say that, but I say that there is a risk to distract the attention from what needs to be done. Because, we, I mean, first, this is a technology that doesn't exist for now. Second, when we look, and we, second, we know that the IPCC assessment that we show are much too optimistic, because when we start looking at what happens concretely in the country, what are the potentials, etc., we see that there are much less potentials for the CCS in the long term, which means that the real question is to go as low as possible in terms of fossil fuel consumptions. Otherwise, we will not manage to just consider the CCS at the scale that's reasonable. So the only edging strategy against this risk and this uncertainty against uh, the development of CCS is to take the measures now in order to go to as low as possible consumption of fossil fuels. And in terms of the discourse, the, the way the IPCC was received, for example, there was a direct relation between ambitious climate goal and large CCS, including for negative emissions, which
I think is a very bad message for short-term action. Okay, last point, and please make it short with a question. Yes, well, Maria Marmes from Universidad Andina. Um, I was wondering, along with this work you're doing of tracking company behavior, fossil fuel company behavior, uh, climate behavior, if you have thought of uh, looking into the financial sector. Because despite the fact that if you, in conventional standard emission accounting, the financial se uh, sector is a low emitter, I believe that they might be one of the world's largest emitters if you look at the, their portfolios. I mean, they, they basically uh, finance uh, economic activity around the world. So would it be a good idea to have um, to record how much uh, climate, how, mu how many emissions are embodied in each of uh, the projects that they finance, both um, multilateral comp companies like the World Bank or the private sector? Great. So just uh, investors are increasingly concerned about these issues. Um, at Exxon and Chevron this year, we saw unprecedented votes in favor of climate-related resolutions approaching two-fifths of the shareholders in both, in both cases. Uh, calling on the companies to report on wh what the what the policy implications of Paris will mean for their for their business. Uh, that said, you know there's still 60% of them out there that that aren't um, on board yet. So there's there's further work to be done on that front, and. Um, I think that the the bankruptcies, of, thank you for pointing out the bankruptcies of, of Arch and Peabody, those are a, a, a cautionary tale and they've also been, uh, the bankruptcy documents of the coal companies have also been a treasure trove in terms of evidence of how these companies have carried out deception campaigns. Uh, so that's, you know, and, and, and that shows what's actually still going on as we, as we get companies publicly claiming that they accept the science. And then on the financial sector, I believe RAND just came out with a study of the, of the private banks, and I think that Christian Aid actually just came out with a study of, of um, the development financing uh, in terms of fossil fuels, so those are both good resources. Last point. Um, so, so on the should these companies exist at all and, and the role of, of CCS in the long term, um, I, I, I don't think these th these, this industry, which remains 10% of the world economy, has already demonstrated it has formidable capabilities for reducing costs and responding to challenges. You know, they've dealt with a reduction, in, and the oil industry has dealt with a reduction in the selling price of their main product by a factor of four and, and continue to make money. I mean, it, it, very few industries could, could do that. Um, and it tells you something about the way they were making money before the reduction in the cost, but you know, it, it's all the same. It, it, it shows that this industry, um, you might hope it will crawl away and die, but it's going to be a long time of dying. And it's the, the, the uh, assumption that the industry won't crack CCS and, and work out how to do it cheaply um, is a very strong one, uh, without any um, empirical foundation, because the industry has never been asked to crack CCS. What they've been done, what, what's happened so far, is the industry has been said, look, if the government pays the cost, will you build a CCS plant? And the result of that, of course, has been a lot of very, 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 very expensive CCS plants. Um, the uh, one one little anecdote which I will finish on, uh, which I was I was told from from uh, somebody within the industry about the world's largest CO2 disposal plant, the Gorgon facility in Australia. Um, that happened not because of a carbon price or because of any um, uh, sort of um, uh, elaborate um, uh, climate-related policy. It happened simply because the government, the state government of the Western Australia, simply told the mining companies, the, the oil extraction companies, that they had to do it in order to extract that uh, that gas. And uh, what this industry insider said to me was, "We thought about it for about, for about five minutes and said yes." I suspect that the industry, if t if simply challenged to get on with it, would think about it for about five, well, they would protest about it for probably more than five minutes, um, but, but once they were done protesting, they would just get on with it, and that is the only hope we have for solving the problem. Okay, thank you all very much. We're going to close questions now.